State Senator Jill Shoup is nearing the end of her tenure in the Missouri General Assembly, and the Creve Corps Democrat has a lot of observations on what's changed in legislative politics over the last 14 years. Shoup joins us on the latest episode of Politically Speaking to talk about her legacy and what the future may hold for the 2nd Congressional District. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. We have to talk about things that matter to people. I've tried to bring that same aggressive iconoclast style with me to uh, the United States Senate. I think my district is a model for the state. We put Missourians first. You just kind of have to find the common ground with people. I believe that this district deserves someone who represents their values. After I came back to St. Louis, I started thinking that I could have a bigger role on the change that I wanted to make. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent, Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me in studio, she is the state senator for Missouri's 24th district, at least for a few more months. Right, right. Jill Shoup. Thank you. So glad to be here. So glad to have you. This is kind of like an exit interview a little bit, even though you may be going back into session soon about taxes. Right. Uh, but your time in Missouri state legislative politics is coming to an end. Right. I mean, couldn't you run for one more term in the House if you really wanted to? If I really wanted to, I could. But you're but not going to. I am. I am. I can commit to the fact that I will not be doing that. So what was your general impression about being in the Missouri legislature from the beginning of 2009 to the end of 2022? Well, a lot of things have changed in terms of the makeup of the legislature, particularly in the House. Um, And a lot of things have changed about me in terms of learning how to really move legislation forward, learning how to um, deal with people who had very different perspectives than me differently than I had. And um, I feel like my service was of value to the people I was there to represent. I got bills passed even in tough environments. And um, learned a lot from it and had a lot of help and support from my constituents along the way. You entered state politics in a time in 2009 after Democrats had a really good election cycle. They had, I think, gained seats in the House, although they had lost seats in the Senate that year. Right. But then won most of the statewide offices. And I think how many people were in the House when you started? 73, 74 Uh, Uh, Democrats. Democrats. There were 74 Democrats when I came in. Our class, um, our freshman class, had 24 Democrats elected that year uh, when Obama was on the ballot the first time for president. We were on the ballot. And the Republicans that year had 21. So we actually had more Democrats elected in uh, the 2008 election starting in 2009. uh, service. This may seem counterintuitive, but was it harder to actually get things done when there were more Democrats because the Republicans saw you more as a threat than when you had 40-ish in the House and 10 in the Senate? Or or, or is that a misbegotten assumption? Well, I think it's an interesting assumption. I think it's part of a calculation based on my experience. Again, there were 24 of us who were brand spanking new to the legislature, even though some of us had had served in other offices prior to that. So, um, yeah, I think that people were very careful on the Republican side of the aisle not to give us much movement on the Democratic side because they didn't want to see our numbers continue to increase. And so... I imagine you enjoyed being in the Senate more than the House. Absolutely. Can you explain why? (laughs) Well, it's interesting. I have... um I think the House I would I would describe to you as more of a circus environment, um, 163 people all jockeying for position, all moving around, all talking while debate was going on on the floor, and uh, a lot of ideas coming forward, and the fact that I could stand up on the floor in front of a microphone trying to get attention from the speaker in order to actually put my ideas forward and never get called on. Mm. In the Senate, that's not the case. Uh, with 34 of us, Uh, We get to know everybody really well. We work together on both sides of the aisle. We're even seated differently. We are mixed among each other. So I'm seated across from Republicans. And anytime I want to speak on an issue, I will be called on to speak on an issue. So when you ran in 2014, um, that was not a great year for Democrats in general. No. 
Now, uh, the the only statewide race was auditor, and Tom Schweik did not have a Democratic opponent. It was a banner year for the Constitution Party and Libertarians because they got like 10 or 20 percent of the vote because there was no Democrat. But there were several state Senate races that were seen as competitive. One was in Jefferson County, which Paul Whelan beat Jeff Orta pretty decisively right. and then flipped the seat. And then, like, Ed Schieffer ran against Jeannie Riddle. That was kind of expected to be competitive. And then Jeannie Riddle won, like, 70-30, right. which kind of showcased, like, Northeast Missouri is totally gone for Democrats. But you were, like, the one bright spot that year. And you it's not like you faced a pushover opponent. You no. faced Jay Ashcroft right. in a race that how, – how much did you both spend – combined. Oh like, my gosh. It had to be like two or three or four million dollars or something. I right? believe that my race alone raised two million, if yeah. I'm remembering correctly. Right. So yes, at least. Um, Do you think that you were able to win because Jay Ashcroft had to kind of modulate himself to be more acceptable for a moderate to liberal district, whereas you could just be say, who I was, be, be who you was? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so I got to be who I was, which was great, which is exactly what you want to be as a, a person trying to uh, provide public service. And Jay Ashcroft, I feel like, um, yeah, I'm not sure what he, why he was running other than to use the Senate as a stepping stone for the next higher office to run for Secretary of State. And um, I think that that came through to people. And I think that, you know, we went out and we knocked on doors over and over again. We wanted to meet people. We wanted to hear what their issues were. And we did. And I learned a lot from people, as I always do when I get the uh, opportunity to speak with them. I don't know how much of that Jay Ashcroft actually did himself. I know that his, com uh, his campaign was out there working. Um, but you know, we only won by 2,000 votes. It was a close race. It's a swing district. But in that year, it was a big win. And I could argue that when he ran statewide and got to be himself, it was better for him rather than right. trying to run. I guess I think people need to understand the context here. You flipped a red district blue, but the 24th district was not a super Republican district. In fact, like John Lamping only won that race in probably the best Republican year in Under our lifetime. Under 200 votes. Yeah. And that, that was after there was a really divisive primary, and that might have weakened Barbara Frazier. Right. And John Lamping didn't have any voting record at that point. So that's right. just kind of a... That's kind of a difficult scenario for Democrats to be in. So because in 2018, you had a Republican opponent, but I think he raised like zero dollars and yes. you won pretty easily yes. uh, based off that. So that's kind of your electoral trajectory. We'll talk about the second district later in the show. What was kind of your initial impressions when you came into the Senate and how did that change over time? So, um, you know, I'm walking into a chamber that's very different from what I've experienced. But I will tell you, right out of the gate, uh, Republicans came and welcomed me and talked to me. And I decided that it was going to be important for me to understand them a little better, to um, to get to know them well. So my first interim period after my first session, uh, I made plans to travel the state of Missouri and to visit my Republican colleagues in their districts with them, if possible, to meet with them to travel a district. And I was welcomed across the state. And it was a wonderful opportunity to learn and to see places where I hadn't necessarily been and to hear what challenges and opportunities others had in their district and to get to know them a little better so that when we got back into session, um, we had developed a relationship. And some people with whom, uh, in terms of policy, I disagree with on many levels, uh, became my friends and became people I could go to and talk to and about all kinds of issues. So this that is, was really helpful. Yeah, this is going to be uh, kind of an insular question, but I think some people have pointed out that as time has gone on, especially in the term limited era, era more and more of the Senate is consisting of former House members who have decided to run for things. And that may have changed things for the worse because the House kind of has a more partisan tinge to it. But it may have actually been helpful because you all kind of knew each other in a certain way in the House, but then got to know each other better in the Senate just because Democrats have more 
inherent power. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that, well, first of all, just the numbers alone. I think 34 versus 163, you have no choice or no no option but to get to know each other better. And you're all getting to get up on whatever issues you care about to speak about them. So um, people hear you. People understand who you are and what you believe. And I think it makes for a better chamber. It doesn't always make for the policy. It doesn't always get the policies I want to move forward to move forward. It doesn't change people's core values or their beliefs about what their constituents want. But uh, it gives us an opportunity to talk. So you have a big piece of paper in front of you. I imagine those are things that passed over your eight to 14 years that you want to mention. Like, What are some of the big accomplishments you had in the actual public policy arena. Right, so just this past legislative session, um, one of one of the big ones is we put money in the budget and got a bill passed to get the lead out of our drinking water in our schools across the state. So Representative Paula Brown on the House side and me on the Senate side uh, worked with organizations to get this done and it will get done. Um, the the lead levels will be checked in drinking fountains and water that's used for cooking across the across the state for districts who want the government's help to do that. It will be available and um, making sure that kids aren't drinking lead because that lead stays in your body and impacts your behavior and your ability to learn. Uh, that's a really big deal, and I'm proud of that work. Um, another bill, interestingly to me, this session that was brought forward by a WashU professor and um, researcher uh, and their son, Gary, who is eight years old, I believe, if I remember correctly, was Gary can't ride on school buses because he has allergies. Mm. And um, buses, contracted bus drivers aren't allowed to use EpiPens. Mm -hmm. This bill allows them to be trained, which takes about five minutes, and allows them to use an EpiPen for a child on a school bus if they believe they're having an anaphylactic reaction. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal to those families who will now be able to send their kids to school more comfortable that they're going to be safe just in that travel to and from uh, schools. And then uh, another big one this session was um, for sexual assault survivors, the Bill of Rights that actually ensures that they will get um, treated well as they go through a very difficult process after a rape. And we believe that this, and this was worked on by a big contingent of people during the interim, um, that they will now, we will now be able to catch more perpetrators because survivors are going to... um, are going to get what they need to not be afraid to come forward and to tell what they can tell about what went on. So another thing that I think has really changed is since you came into the Senate is there's been an expansion of the amount of Republican female senators that are now serving. Right. How has that changed the dynamics? Because there's obviously been some high profile examples where the women of the Senate stood up as a bipartisan unit and have been able to really effectuate policy change. Uh, It's been it's turned out to to be very good and very helpful. So instead of the one Republican senator who was there when I came in and we came in together, we served in the House together, that Senator Jeannie Riddle, there are now five Republican senators and six Democratic senators. So 11 of us total, which is the largest number of women in Missouri Senate in its 200-year history. Uh, so think about that for a minute, 11 out of 34. And we came together... Um, a couple of sessions ago, brought together by actually a lobbyist and a department head to come over and have dinner at this department head's home uh, just to relax and just to enjoy each other's company. And we started talking about what we could do as the 11 of us to leave a lasting legacy that would be helpful to the people of this state. And we focused on the issue of literacy. We want to make sure that all kids uh, can read and read on grade level by the time they're in fourth grade. That's when they start to, instead of reading to or learning to read, they start to read to learn. And um, in that effort, uh, we came together. We have written this book that you just recently mentioned. And in early August, we start traveling the state to talk about literacy, not just to talk about it, but to learn from communities about what needs they have in terms of helping their kids in their schools learn to read. So there were two instances that I can think of where the women of the Senate made an impact. One was redistricting, where they stood up and basically was like, this whole standoff is a bunch of nonsense, and there's a lot of grandstanding going on. And the, the other one was in 20... 
21 during a special session where there was discussion about whether certain forms of contraception were going to be covered by Medicaid anymore. And you actually saw Republican female senators who are very conservative. Cindy O'Loughlin is a good example of this saying, we're, we're not going to we're not going to stand for this sort of stuff anymore. Right. This was about the FRA, the federal reimbursement allowance, which draws down federal dollars in the state of Missouri. And they're a, a, it's a big number in the state of Missouri and provides a lot of money to help support the Medicaid program in our state. And we were the the led the Senate was at a standstill. And it was uh, my colleague, Senator Doug Beck, who came to me and said, you know, you get along really well with the Republican women. Why don't you go to them and talk to them about um, not putting this anti-birth uh, control legislation on the federal reimbursement allowance. Let's get it. Let's get it passed clean so we can draw down these dollars. So I went to my colleague Senator Riddle. She and I had taken the lead on getting this book done, and we brought in the other senators. Talked about the impact of this legislation on women's ability to control their their future and their destiny through the use of birth control. We all came to an agreement. We brought in the sponsor of the amendment. We told him we weren't going to stand for that. He went back and and uh, ran the traps on his end, agreed with us, and we got a clean federal reimbursement allowance passed for se- for three years. We didn't just pass it for that year. So it was a really big deal, and it was the first time we as a group had used our power and our strength to, to put our, our collective feet down and say, this this is what's good for Missouri. This is what's good for Missouri women and families. We are together on this. Join us. We'll be right back after this quick break with State Senator Jill Shoup. And we're back on Politically Speaking with State Senator Jill Shoup. She is a Democrat from Creve Core. So we talked about instances where you were able to work together with Republicans. But I think your other role as a Democratic senator is filibustering against things that you think are not so good. Right. And it's really been interesting to see how Democrats have tried to use this procedural power. And for our listeners, I'm sure people who are listening to this know what this filibuster is. But in case you don't, in the Missouri Senate, senators have the ability to stand up and talk for an indefinite amount of time. Right. Um, which means that even though there are only 10 Democratic senators right now, if all of them are opposed to a bill and they all stand up in unison, like they can kill legislation unless you use what's known as a previous question motion to stop a filibuster. And that is just generally seen as a nuclear option bad thing, basically. Yes, right. So I hope that that is a little bit inside baseball, but it's important for us to talk about before we dive into this part of the conversation. Did your perception of the filibuster ch- uh, change from when you entered the Senate to when you exited the Senate? Yes. In the beginning, I saw it as just a tool to try to stop things with that threat of a PQ, a previous question, the end of debate and going debate on the bill hanging over our head, um, that nuclear option you described. Um, but what I saw as I moved forward was that the filibuster could be used as a tool um, for negotiation uh, off the off the floor of the Senate. So if I had a bill that I was very concerned about and my colleagues were willing to hold the floor, I could go and talk it through with the Senate sponsor or with the lobbyists who were paid to be there to uh, try to get their legislation passed. And I will tell you that for me particularly, I mean, the filibuster got used um, quite a bit. Um, that's why some things were able to be stopped at certain points in time. Um, the filibuster was used specifically uh, to make sure that we didn't have changes made to the initiative petition process this legislative session, which um, me- meant that the standards for the people getting a petition on the ballot to vote on, um, this would have raised the standards, made it much harder to do that. And we, the Democrats, stood together and got that um, bill laid aside so it didn't pass. But I can guarantee you it will be before the legislature next session, too, because what we know is when the people get the opportunity to do that, they tend to vote in a more progressive way. Um, It is how we got Medicaid expansion actually done. It is how we stopped right to work. Uh, There are several examples of things that were done through initiative petition by a vote of the people. So there are instances, though, when Democrats decide to let a bill go through, and that can be pretty dispiriting. I mean, 
2019, the abortion legislation, which had the trigger language, was not PQ'd. It was passed because Senate Democrats made the calculation not to not to force a PQ on it. But I think from talking with you earlier, you're you had basically been told like we had to negotiate on this. Are they were going to previous question it? Yes. So sometimes we do. And sometimes that's we don't know if that threat is an idle threat or not. And we can't afford to let an original bill go through in its form. We need to see what things we can modify in order to make it somewhat more palatable. Um, one example that I have worked on, and, and not all of my Democratic colleagues agree with me, but I feel like the utilities continue to take away um, the ability of the Public Service Commission to uh, oversee and control their rate increases. And so I have um, worked hard to stop some of that and to make sure the Public Service Commission has the power it should. These are monopoly utilities. They don't have a competitor in the marketplace. So the legislature needs to act as that proxy for the market. I don't feel like the legislature as a whole does that well. So some of my colleagues were willing to hold the floor for me while I stepped off the floor for literally hours and hours and hours to do everything I could to make sure that um, we had protections in for consumers. And I'm starting to get letters from some of my constituents right now that says that are saying, my utility bills are going up so high, what's going on? This is the impact when we give the utilities, continuously give them the power to raise their rate. When I started reporting on Missouri politics in 2006, there were obviously people actually in both parties who were, quote unquote, opposed to abortion yes, rights. Yes, there were. But I don't know if like the opponents were like, let's ban abortion except for medical emergencies. Like the default was I'm opposed to abortion except for rape, incest, uh, you know, medical emergencies. How do you think it got to a point where the default position was like a full abortion ban with only exceptions for medical emergencies, but not for people that get pregnant because of rape or incest? I think it's uh, unbelievable to me, but this is what we've seen is nationally and at the state level, we've seen Republicans move further and further and further to the right and try to sort of outdo each other in terms of their legislation. So when you are on that kind of trajectory that you have to be even more conservative than, than either your opponent or the person who came before you, uh, you get to a place where there is just no, where else do you go? And I think that, um, truth be told, I think that individual senators, if you were able, or legislators, if you were able to talk to them in a truthful way one-on-one, -on -one, they would say, this is horrible for the people of Missouri. Why do we want somebody experience an ectopic pregnancy not to be able to... Um, to have an abortion here in the state of Missouri? Why do we want to send people elsewhere? Why do we want to send that 10-year-old girl who was raped or a victim of incest, why do we want to insist that she carry a child to term? Yeah, and I think, I guess, proponents of the trigger law would say an ectopic pregnancy would fall under medical emergencies. But I know that Democrats want to, like, make that We want to make it clear, clear. And that's why a letter went out from uh, the Senate leader and the House leader to say to send to Governor Parson, if you're calling a special session, let's deal with these issues, too. Let's clarify. Now, this is actually a good way to segue into the second district. You ran in the second district in 2020, which features a lot of voters who are opposed to abortion rights under certain circumstances. Right. The question that a lot of political reporters are asking now is, is banning abortions except for medical emergencies with no exceptions for people that become pregnant because of rape or incest too far for those voters like what's kind of, i mean you're going to probably say yes but like if we have a the 2022 election cycle and republicans win everything again wouldn't the answer be that they're okay with this basically well you know I I don't, I don't know the what the answer will be, even regardless of who wins, because there are other things going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, none of this stands in isolation unless this is your one issue that you care about. Um, I think the people of the of the second district do not believe that there should never be access to abortion. I think that there are cases where they they believe that there should be, and I think many of them believe it should not be the government's decision. It should be an individual's decision. So. Um, I think the second district will will care that this has been that 
with what is uh, care deeply about what has gone on um, at the Supreme Court level and how it's impacted Missouri. But I also think their pocketbooks are are going to be um, considered. So you know, increased costs are really problematic for a lot of people, and um, that's the first thing you you know when your when your grocery bill is increased. You know when you're when it takes much more money to in, to to uh, to put gas in your car, and where they where they cast the blame for that may be. Um, how, determine how they vote. So when you ran against Ann Wagner in 2020, you lost by about six percentage points. And yes. then two years before, Court Van Ostrin ran against Ann Wagner and lost by three. And that was in a district which the Daily Cost analyzed. Uh, Donald Trump won the district by 115 votes. And now you have a situation where you've added Franklin and Warren counties, which voted for Trump 70%. Um, and you put into the fact that, like, people are genuinely concerned about the economy and they're going to blame Democrats who control the Congress and the, and the presidency. There are a lot of people who feel like it is the second district is a lost cause now and it's going to be a lost cause for 10 years. What's kind of your feeling about that? Well, um, first of all, I hope that's not true. And, you know, last year, 2020 election that I was in against Ann Wagner, it was a unique election for a lot of reasons, including the fact that we were locked down. We were we had COVID rampant and um, people like me were not going door to door to protect the health of others as well as ourselves. And so it was an election unlike any I had been in. Uh, All I did was sit on the phone and make phone calls to people, which, you know, there were some great conversations and a lot of money raised. Um, But I think people want to hear and see you out in public. Not to interrupt. 2020 was the most dreadful election cycle I've ever covered as a reporter, primarily <laughs> right. because there were no campaign events. Everything was done over Zoom, with some exceptions. I did actually go to people's houses and do podcasts with them, including Ann Wagner's, uh, believe it or not. But just the lack of political action, just it was just depressing. Like, And I know it was difficult for candidates who felt like they didn't feel comfortable going door to door, which isn't really the case now. Both Ray Reed and Trish Gumby are both going door to door right Right. now. So continue. Right. So I think we have some excellent Democratic candidates um, and they are out there and they are talking to people and listening to people. You know, if you look at Trish Gumby, she turned around a really tough uh, House district and um, she has a lot of respect from people on both sides of the aisle. So I am hopeful um, that one of these candidates will emerge as the victor in the primary and and will give. And, you know, when you consistently um, let people know what the, per- the incumbent is or is not doing for the community, uh, over time, I think the community starts to hear. And this will be the third election where I feel like we have spent a lot of money and a lot of time and effort trying to demonstrate to the public what she has or hasn't done. And I hope that pays off in this election it's, cycle. It's really an interesting situation about how the second district has been configured, because I think it's probably now a plus seven or plus eight Republican district. But that means there's a lot of Democrats that live there. In yes. fact, I live in the second district now because I live in the part of Richmond Heights that was taken around Webster Groves and is now in the second district. And I can guarantee you everybody in my neighborhood is voting for Democratic candidates right. um, because it is like progressive central. But I think that the key to making this district like it was in 2020 and 2018 is you're going to have to go to Franklin County especially and start making inroads there. Like, if you don't, you may have candidates that are able to win the St. Louis County part and hold down the St. Charles part, but it's not going to matter if you're getting blown out in Franklin County. Like, what's your thought about that? Well, I think that you're. I think that that's true, but I also think that I've seen the candidates, um, and they're going. To, they're going to those places, and I think that they're they're working hard and they're working smart, and I think. Uh, uh, and I've, I've heard more from Trish Gumby, and I talk to her more often, so I'm going to speak to her campaign. Um, but Ray Reed is a great guy, too. Um, but Trish is out there doing that, and Trish is out there meeting those voters, and she has a lot of people helping her do that. So uh, this is, again, an insular question, but, like, national Democratic groups are probably going to look at this district. They're going to be like, this is too Republican. They're not going to pour the same amount of national resources that they 
they did to you or even to maybe Court Van Ostrin. But I've also heard that that's not like there are pluses and minuses to having third party support. In fact, I talked with Jason Kander about this. Like he had to spend a lot of time in 2016 convincing Democratic national groups that he was viable. So maybe doing less of that means more time campaigning. I, I don't know. You, I, this that may be too insular of a question for you, but I'd be interested in. Your well, take. you know, I the um, the Democratic uh, Congressional Campaign Committee. Um, bought into my campaign early on. As a matter of fact, they were also encouraging me to run. They saw me as a as a, a potential victor in the second congressional district. And um, so I had help from them. Um, I had a lot of advice and a lot of good help and a lot of financial support come my way through them that without it, the numbers might have even been worse during during that campaign and during COVID. And you may recall, I mean, we had Every organization that was um, doing research and and doing polling said we were going to win that race. So um, nobody was as surprised as me. I did not think. First of all, I was surprised by the margin, and yes. and, and and that's a credit to you because I thought you were a really good candidate, and I thought you hadn't really made a lot of mistakes. But frankly, Ann Wagner's a really good candidate too, and I think pe- Democrats that continually underestimate her are doing so at their own peril. Because in addition to being just a very good fundraiser, yes, uh, she does have experience in grassroots Republican politics, especially yes, in St. Louis County. So when time comes to like organize people to go door to door or organize her campaign to help her, she knows how to do that. Sure. So, She's the so, former head of the Republican Party. So again, I, I think it is, again, I think you underestimate her at her own peril. Now, we can talk in 2024 about whether she can win a Republican primary. That's a whole other separate conversation. Right. But given that, like, it is assumed she's going to make it to November, I mean, we got to, we cannot talk about this race without talking about her strength as well. And that's kind of my feeling about that. Well, absolutely. I mean, she's been serving in this role now for a while, and there's a reason for that. And, and I don't think it's because, uh, well, from my perspective, I don't think it's because she's a great congresswoman. I think it's because she knows how to do that retail kind of politics. One last question before I let you go. I actually want to take the lens back and talk about statewide Democratic politics. First, are you are you done running for anything? Is Jill Shoup finished, or is there a statewide run in twenty twenty four? Oh my gosh, no. Okay, no statewide run. Okay, good. So you can look at this from a <laughs> from a a, a non interesting. Uh, you can look at this from a objective perspective. When I was talking with Jason Kander, he said like. Democrats have to stop going to people like him, Claire McCaskill, Jay Nixon, and say, oh, please run for this statewide office. We need you to run. You're our only hope. Because in his view, that is basically creating these quote unquote saviors that will come in and do the hard work that needs to win a statewide race um, without building the infrastructure. Right. And I I couldn't agree more with him. Like, I, I think that that is a I think if Democrats are going to win statewide again, you can't just expect somebody who was successful 10 years ago to come back and recreate the vaunted urban, suburban, rural rural coalition I talked about before. Uh, what is it going to take, like, basically? Well, I, I, first of all, I will say that uh, Michael Butler and Randy Dunn are working hard to build a Democratic Party here in the state that doesn't just sit down every two years in between races and then have a start from scratch again. They were trying to build an infrastructure that is ongoing. We need to build a bench. We need to find people who are going to run for office uh, and not necessarily start at at the top, but get on school boards, get on city councils, learn how government works, be part of solutions in your community, see if this is something you like to do. If you don't want to go further, fine, support people who do, but also we cannot stop in between races. We need to continue to build a bench and to grow. And we can't expect people who were successful two, four, six, ten years ago to come back and be the saviors. I, Things have changed. I think the problem, too, is that you have people that like are going through the state legislative process like you did. They make it to the state Senate. They term out. And if they're presented with an option of running for statewide office or running for Kansas City City Council, which pays like $60,000, $70,000 a year, or something 
I mean, I don't know why you would want to serve on the county council in St. Louis <laughs> County. It seems like a horrible job and it does not pay enough. But doing something on a local level where you have a better chance of winning, a lot of people are Democrats are taking those options as, as opposed to doing the things that like Clint Zweifel did, for example. He was in the House. He ran for treasurer. He won. Our Jason Kander in the House ran for ran secretary, of State, for secretary right. Chris Coster in the Senate, ran for attorney, attorney general. general. Right. How do you get that? like track back on track where you, you're you're basically having legislators start at the state legislative rev- level and kind of getting them up to a point where they can run statewide successfully again. Let me say this to you. the Even though our numbers are few in the House and the Senate, there are some great people there, some strong Democratic legislators in both chambers. And I think that it's standing with them, standing behind them, and and pushing them forward and supporting them. I know that we're at a place right now where um, we don't have a lot of people running for statewide office, but we will again. And um, I just think that people are are doing the work they want to do and need to do, and that's why they ran for the state legislature, but they will not be done when they are th- when they are termed out of office. Well, Senator, thank you so much for coming in today, and it's been a pleasure following your uh, legislative and political career from I think even before you were. I think we met each other before you were in office we in two thousand and eight. I remember exactly. It's just same thing with Jason Kander. Jason Kander came into my office at the Columbia Tribune, I think in two thousand seven, but while he was running. So it's just been and and Stephen Weber being the same right. situation. Like I met him even before he ran for office. So it's just been fun to see all of you like... And the three of us are still very close friends. The three of us came into the House together, so we will always have those connections. It's just been fun to see the the trajectory. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. You can follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum and read all of our stories at stlpr.org. In addition to providing your Twitter account, can you provide more information about You Can Too and how to get it? Yes. So um, my Twitter account is at Jill Shoop. You Can Too is for sale online through uh, Missouri Life Magazine. This is not Pro Life. This is Missouri Life Magazine. It's fourteen ninety five. Also, if your school uh, fourth grade classes or school libraries don't have them yet, please contact your senator, male or female. Uh, they have access to these books, and we want to get these books into the hands of children. We want your children and the kids you know in your neighborhood to be able to read. That's what this is all about. We'll be traveling the state and hope to see you in your community uh, starting on August 5th. Thank you very much. And until next time, so long.